गुड आफ्टरनून लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन फर्स्ट ईयर के कितने लोग हैं यहां सेकेंड ईयर थर्ड ईयर फोर्थ ईयर नॉन बीटेक नॉन बीटेक ओके गुड गुड आई थॉट सो गुड वेरी डिलाइटेड टू सी यू ऑल हियर स्पेशली कंसिडरिंग दैट दिस इज द मिडल ऑफ द एग्जामिनेशन वीक I am very, very pleasantly surprised and feel so proud to see our students being so interested. Thank you for being here today. We have today a very, very distinguished and a very special speaker. Dheeraj Pandey did his B Tech from IIT Kanpur Computer Science, 1997. I met him in San Francisco in October last year or November last year, maybe. Before meeting him, I sent an email to my dear friend at IIT Kanpur, Dheeraj Sanghi, who is a professor of computer science, and I said, Dheeraj, you might know this other Dheeraj, because he was a student in your department, and do you have anything to tell me? And he said, you are going to meet a person who will talk to you as a very enlightened professor if you are talking to him as a professor, and he will talk to you as a very enlightened industry leader if you are talking to him as an industry leader. And indeed, I was absolutely zapped meeting him in my first uh, encounter. I learned many things, and after that, many things I have been quoting him and telling people. My second meeting with him in June this year, again in San Francisco, was again on the same lines. Every time I meet him, I come back thinking about life, thinking about interesting things. In him, we have a very enlightened individual who happens to have made a huge impact on industry, on computer science industry, computer uh, industry. Uh, he, after his B.Tech in computer science at IIT Kanpur, went to United States. Uh, there is a university, University of Texas, Austin, joined there for a PhD program, went to San Francisco for an internship, liked it enough to say to Austin that, guys, please wait, I want to do some more industry work before I come for PhD. And he never went back. Worked for uh, IT industry and about nine years back set up a company called Nutanix. And this company has been a talk of the town in Silicon Valley. About two years back, it went public. It means that its shares were uh, on the stock exchange. You could buy his shares, company shares. And uh, almost a year back, I don't know what is the current situation, but a year back it was its valuation was like $6 billion or something. And now it might be 10, I don't know the speed with which they are growing, and just to give a sense to you, what is $6 billion? Uh, $6 billion will make it about 45,000 crore rupees. How much? Uh, just to understand this, we spent 500 crore rupees to construct IIT Gandhinagar's buildings. So the company that he built the market feels its value is about how many times of the IT buildings? 90. If his company were to encash its value, they can build 90 IIT Gandhinagar's. And he's a 97 BTEC, that is about 21 years after his BTEC. Okay. I will not come in between him and you. They, they work in like 40 countries. They work, uh, I don't know. They, he will perhaps tell you a little bit more about. It has been an absolutely mind-boggling success story of an individual, of an IIT graduate. And when people ask me, what is your expectations of IIT Gandhi, this is my expectation. In Dheeraj, uh, uh, in Dheeraj we have today a future of typical IIT Gandhinagar graduates that I'm seeing. Dheeraj. Good. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming here. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be standing in front of all of you, the future uh, uh, entrepreneurs and professionals. I think this is okay. It's fine. Thank you. Of uh, of this country and, and of, this, of this world, actually. This is you all are world citizens. And uh, uh, for what Dr. Jen said, I'm really humbled and honored to be here. Um, 
as he said, you know, he and I met uh, almost a year ago, and I just found an entrepreneur in him which I could relate to, who I could relate to. Somebody who was uh, really an outsider was thinking about uh, building an institute, an institution, and uh, something for posterity, something that uh, could really last forever. And I could really relate to that. You know, although uh, I did go to school at IIT Kanpur, I could relate to Dr. Jain as somebody that uh, I could work with uh, for long. And that's how our relationship really started. Uh, in fact, we met again, and my respect for him and uh, what he has been building, I, I gush about him when I talk to other people around. Uh, he has a huge fan following at Nutanix, which is also in Bangalore. Um, and uh, in fact, for some of you who uh, uh, know Nutanix, we'll talk more about the company. Right now, I'm also privileged to have some of my colleagues here as well. Uh, there is uh, Sankalp, who runs India. There's Ritesh, who also has built India in the last uh, multiple years. We have Jennifer Massaro and uh, Gary Walker, my colleagues from Nutanix who uh, live in San Francisco and uh, Singapore, respectively. So I was thinking about uh, what to really spend time on. And I, I figured rather than be extremely uh, professorial, which, by the way, I think I could be in an institution of this uh, repute, I thought I'd talk about lessons, learnings. Like, what did I learn from life in the last so many years? And who are the people I learned from? Because at the core of it all is about uh, mentors and advisors and people you can follow for long and really build some core principles of what success means, what happiness means, and a framework for thinking. So over the course of uh, these many years, I've, I've learned some of that. So taking a step back in life, uh, you know, I uh, grew up uh, in Patna. Uh, I, I was uh, spending a lot of time with my uh, maternal uh, family in Hazaribagh uh, and uh, my paternal family in a small place called Gaya, which is uh, not very far from Patna itself. And my father uh, was a psychiatrist, so definitely he was extremely cranial and cerebral about life in general. For everything, he would say, go drink some water. I'm like, I have some problem. Let's go drink some water, actually. <laughs> and then he, later on, he would ask me, are you OK? Are you depressed? I'm like, come on, this psychiatry thing has actually take, taken over uh, uh, what you do. But it was uh, fascinating to just learn from someone who was thinking a lot about the mind and the brain. And my mother was a school teacher. And we went through a lot in life, uh, you know, because the Bihar government was corrupt back in the day. Uh, I've heard it's improved. Uh, you folks probably know more about it. but. Uh, my father used to work for the Bihar government, and uh, he would really get paid. You know, every six months there would be a salary. Now, salaries in reality are supposed to be monthly, but back in the day he used to get it every six months, if that. You know, there'd be times when he'd get it every 12 months, um, and uh, that's how dysfunctional the system really was. And I grew up in that system. It was probably the most corrupt state uh, of the country, the most lawless state back in the day. Uh, but it really built a lot of grit because, uh, you know, my parents, especially my mom, went through a lot. And um, I think that adversity actually built a lot of uh, support structure around us, uh, especially financially and even emotionally, actually. So it was a very coarse, uh, I would say, uh, highly challenged middle class upbringing, uh, lower middle class, because even though they were highly educated, uh, we were not financially well off, you know, so we'd get a lot of help from people around us, including my uncles and my, uh, both, on both uh, uh, the paternal side and the maternal side. And uh, along the way, I, I actually turned out to be uh, a kid who was interested in math and science, and, but uh, things uh, were definitely uh, in, in my head. It's like, you know, what should I be really doing? I mean, at age four, uh, I remember I was probably too stubborn uh, and uh, a lot of my elder cousins who were 10, 15, 20 years elder than me, they, they gave me a nickname, even though I had nothing to do with that name at all, they called me Uttal. And I said, this guy is Uttal. And I was one of those guys who was really, amongst the cousins, was really resolute for some things that I really wanted. And it helps me these days, you know, the word Uttal, I use it in my own head. I'm like, look, I can't waver because obviously there's big parts of the world that doesn't want your company to exist, to survive, and obviously there's tons of competitors. And you have to keep remembering that word atal. Like, what does it mean to be resolute when you're really down some path? 
So, uh, you know, I was uh, 20, 21, and one of my cousins helped me. He wrote me a check of $1,000 to even apply to the universities in the U.S. because we didn't have that kind of a money back then, and I had to apply to 10 schools, and each school would take about $100 of application fee as well. Uh, so he helped me with that, and he turned out to be a well-off guy himself. He sold a pretty large company worth uh, a couple of billion dollars back in the day. But uh, I think, and I remember the $1,000 uh, that he actually wrote me a check for. Uh, and uh, with, with that, I actually applied to the U.S. schools. Now, when I was about to go to the U.S., uh, we didn't have enough money to fly. I'm like, how do I travel from uh, here to the U.S.? And uh, the typical word jugar was actually quite uh, you know, relevant back then as well. How many of you actually celebrate the word jugar? Anybody here? Jugar in homeworks and projects and... Of course, and those of you who didn't raise your hands, please do understand the word jugar. It means a lot. It's hustle, by the way. Like, how do you hustle? Uh, so in that hustle, I found out about a couple of these conglomerates. And these conglomerates uh, were extremely giving. They were giving in the sense that they would actually go and pay you some money for nothing in return. And those two conglom conglomerates happen to be uh, the Jane Tata Foundation. So there's a Jane Tata Endowment Fund from the Tatas. And there was a KC Mahindra you know, Education Trust. And both of these together gave me, uh, back in the day, about $3,000. And uh, I bought a ticket for $1,000. Um, and uh, I left $1,000 with my parents. And I went to the U.S. with $900, you know, and uh, I still remember the word help. You know, there was, there was this heart in the system that was very, very uh, influential in, in my career in general. My, my cousin gave me $1,000, and or Jane Tata's, Casey Mahindra's, they actually helping me uh, to come to the U.S. And of course, before that, uh, like in the late 80s and the early 90s, uh, my mama, one of my maternal uncles, he used to send us like 1,200 rupees a month for, for just the support of the family. You know? So I still have it in my head because you know, he probably uh, paid us, I don't know, maybe two, three thousand dollars in, in entirety. But when the time came to help him, like in the last three years, I gave him $100,000 and said, look, you take whatever it takes to really start your business. But it's not the money, it's the fact that it was those 1,200 rupees a month that really mattered to our family and to everybody else around us, actually. So um, remember the word. It's giving is important. Uh, and uh, you know, it, at some level, the support structure that you actually form with your uh, people, your family, your friends, those things actually take you to a certain level. And I can't forget, uh, forget any of these things that really helped me to get to the US. Now, I go to the US, and um, as Dr. Jan said, you know, I was, uh, I was admitted to uh, UT Austin. I had scholarships at other places, and I got a lot of help in deciding where do, where do I land. You know, I had another uh, RA ship from Urbana Champaign, uh, computer science department, and you know, C Columbia, and a couple other places, Northwestern, and, and places like that. And um, there was another friend of mine which, who's a good friend now, but back then I just knew him as somebody who was two years senior to me. Uh, from IIT Kanpur. His name is Gokul Rajaram. Uh, any of you have heard of Gokul Rajaram here? Gokul? Uh, probably no one, but folks who really have come to know Google, and one of the products that Google has is called AdSense, and he was really the first product manager of Google, Google AdSense. And he took all those lessons to Facebook for four years, and then finally he's at Square, the chief product officer of Square. Uh, and uh, he, back then, was two years senior to me from Kanpur. And he had a very similar sort of background. He was like, well, I had similar decisions to make. And he spent a lot of time with me trying to really deliberate on whether I should go to Austin, whether I should go to Urbana-Champaign, or whether I should go take a job with Deloitte in Chicago. I had another job in Chicago from Deloitte uh, Consulting. So again, help. You know, I got a lot of help from people around me who were willing to counsel and advise and support my decision making itself. And that's kind of the recurring theme of what I'm going to talk about today is counsel, advice, mentors, people that you can learn from. So I go to the US. Uh, I spend a couple of years in the university. I take my master's. Uh, and uh, at uh, 22, actually, while I was just three, four months, uh, three months in the university, I actually bump into a person online. 
uh, this girl who is uh, two years younger than me, and I just meet her online, and her name is uh, Sapna. And uh, I'd never really met her face to face. You know, this was, I was in Austin, and she was in Muscat, Oman. And, uh, you know, she had gone there for her uh, vacation, for Diwali vacation in October. And she was uh, going to college in, uh, in uh, Mount Carmel, Bangalore. And her parents were always uh, in the Middle East, so they were spending a lot of time in Muscat, Oman. And before that, they, was in, they were in Iraq and Saudi Arabia. But you can see how uh, life actually happens. You know, there was this uh, event where I just bumped into her on an online site. And back, back in the day, we didn't have any Messenger or IRQ or a lot of the things that you folks take for granted today. Uh, some people in the room probably will remember, uh, you know, things like a chat site. So there was a chat site called TalkCity.com. And there was a room called Bombay. And this was two months out of uh, India. I was probably feeling homesick, so I said, let's, let's try this room. And there's a bunch of Indians there, you know, that I can actually relate to. And I ended up in Bombay, and I bump into a girl, and I chat with her for nine hours, like straight nine hours the first day, October 20th of 1997. And uh, in three weeks later, I started calling her. And three years, three and a half years later, after long-distance dating, I actually marry her in 2000. So uh, back in 2000, I got married to Sapna, and, and uh, this is just how life unfolds. You know, you probably never expected to meet somebody like that. And, uh, and I met her first time at 10 months after my first uh, sort of real um, meeting with her, which was all online, you know, in August of uh, 1998. And I, was, I remember I was interning at Oracle in the summer of 98 for the first time. And I, I come back to India for the first time. But I don't tell my parents that I'm in India. Now, that is like really audacious. Remember, you're, you've left the country for the first time. You're coming back to the country, but you don't tell your parents that you're in the country. Uh, somewhat entrepreneurial back in the day. But I really didn't know what to say. tell my mom. It's like, what do I tell her? Like, oh, I'm coming to see a girl. Like, what, where did you meet the girl? Well, I didn't meet her, but I met her, right? It's like there's this uh, virtual reality thing happening. And, Obviously, back then, there was no Facebook, so you, it was very hard to explain to people, like, what does it mean to meet someone, right? Um, so I uh, spent, like, 10 days in Hyderabad with her. Her parents were here. Obviously, it was highly chaperoned because, you know, back in the day, it was difficult for a boy and a girl who don't even know each other and their families to really spend any time. But it was highly entrepreneurial. You know, I, she and I had decided to actually get married right then, and, like, look, we're going to get married. And, Took another two and a half years for, of long distance dating and a lot of telephone dollars. You know, I spent, you spent like $5,000 a month when I was not making a ton of money. I had like loans and everything. I had no student loans, but I had loans for really just talking to her on the phone. And um, I remember India was still expensive. Calling India was like 80 cents a minute. Uh, but calling Muscat was $2.24 a minute. You know, obviously, there was arbitrage happening here, the same phone lines that actually end up in Muscat or, or India, but because of supply-demand curves, you end up actually paying more for, for Muscat. Uh, and uh, there were some difficult moments in the 1999, 2000, before I got married. And I remember going to her and telling her a very unromantic way, look, we've got to get married now, if nothing, just to save on taxes. She's like, what? What did he just say? <laughs> like, you know. But uh, finally, we got married, and now we have three kids over time. But starting in 2000, I actually worked for, uh, you know, about nine years for three different companies. Uh, worked for Oracle for four and a half years and a, and a couple of startups along the way as well. But there was a recurring theme in my, in my overall work. And the recurring theme was how do you use software uh, to make small machines look like one large system? So you have to take a bunch of small machines and you put software on top. And you provide the facade of a single system. And that's the magic of software, that it, it actually can virtualize uh, or can abstract small things and can really hide the small things and make them look like one big thing. Uh, that over time, the world has actually come to call virtualization. You know, the word virtualize is used in many, many ways. But that was the recurring theme of my three jobs. I said, look, uh, we don't believe in big systems. We believe in small systems that eventually come together to build big systems, that have a facade of a big system, even though the underlying components are actually small and commodity and are cheap. So uh, in the year 2009, uh, you know, me and a couple of other people, we were friends, we had known each other for a while. Uh, we started this company called Nutanix. Um, 
And uh, the idea was very basic, and this is probably one of the big lessons that you'll also learn as you go on to become entrepreneurs, is that you don't need a rocket scientist to explain the idea. It has to be something really, really simple. Now you'd say if, you know, if the idea is simple and can be explained in like four or five words, then it probably is copyable. Somebody can imitate it and copy it. But that's not where the competitive edge is. It's not in ideas that are very profound that it takes you forever to explain to someone. It's in simple ideas that you execute really well on. Uh, and uh, our idea was very simple. Back in the day, <clears throat> there was this uh, big data revolution happening around us. And the big data revolution was, uh, was called Hadoop. Uh, for those of you, anybody here uh, use Hadoop at all? Anybody know the word Hadoop? Uh, maybe 2, 3, 5%, 10% of the people. Uh, the word Hadoop was getting popular in the, in the late 2000s. And it was about using uh, commodity hardware, commodity servers, and really using software on top to go and analyze data, large amounts of data using software with no specialized hardware. You know, everything was about commodity servers, Intel servers, stitch them together through commodity networks. And then you bring data and compute together so you can actually do things fast. But you also do things in a divide and conquer way where you divide and conquer the problem. So you don't need God boxes. There's no need for a big machine which is expensive and unreliable and is difficult to access. How do you get to data fast using commodity servers, uh, which means you have easy access to these machines, to the hardware, and you put software on top to really go and uh, work on very large data sets. So that was getting popular in the consumer uh, cloud with Facebooks and Googles and Amazons and, and so on. And our premise was that, look, this thing cannot just be at the periphery of analytics and big data. We have to take this architecture, which was also getting really popular in the consumer cloud world, you know, this idea of commoditized hardware with software on top. Uh, and uh, that would actually give you access to data really, really fast because now you brought these together. Applications and data are very close to each other. But more importantly, you can start small. You don't need to really start big. You know, and I think that's an important uh, virtue of entrepreneurship as well, that you, you think big, but you start small and you iterate. You really put more things on top as your experiment is working, you start to go and double down on that experiment. And that's one of the big uh, you know, real foundations of any good system is you don't need to start big because if you really want to start big, you need a ton of money and a lot of uh, facilities and power and equipment and all that stuff to even get things going. And instead, you really want to start small and actually want to build something that's architecturally elastic, that's architecturally extensible. So you don't have to throw away that thing when you get to something bigger. And that's the crux of uh, most things, even when you're building a company, that you don't want to just hack it up. Because when you hack something up as an architecture, you have to throw it away and start again. Instead, you want to think about what decisions are extensible and the fact that you can really go and extend them. And it's not a one-way street. I can go change and navigate and, and you know, micro pivot if I have to, but it's an extensible decision that you actually made, as opposed to decisions that are never going to be reversible. So you're going to have to throw away this architecture and start again. And that was the crux of our overall product as well. The fact that you wanted to build something that could start really small, and over time you can actually add to that. But really bring this architecture to the masses, not just leave it in the context of uh, big data and things that people are going to build in the next decade, which is this last decade, but to all the applications of the last 20 years. And that was where the money was. In fact, the money statement and everything I just say right now is when you take a new idea to an old world is where the money is. You know, and that's how you really build successful companies. Because if you expect a new idea and a new market, you have two new things. And that's now a second order idea. You know, and when I say second order, you need two things to work. The first one, which is under your control, that's the system you build. But the second one is not in your control, which is a new market. So you can't make two assumptions when you're really building companies. You've got to take one that's under your control. That's, let's call it a new architecture. But you've got to backport it, like teleport it to an old world. And that's how you really bring newness to an old world. And this is exactly what companies like Apple and others have actually done. Think about it. 
20 years ago, uh, I'm guessing some of you are not even born 20 years ago, but 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago, the things that were popular with uh, consumers are playing music, taking photos, taking videos, uh, you know, hailing a cab, uh, doing emails, talking on the phone, are the exact same things that are just as popular today as well, right? Music, cameras, videography, ride hailing, emails, phone calling, texting. These are the kind of things that people do as much now as they used to do 20 years ago. What changed is the way you consume those things. Like music was consumed very differently 20, 25 years ago, probably as physical devices, which were these CDs. And before that, there used to be these massively large vinyls, vinyl records. But you know, the way we consume them is what really changed. But the notion of music and taking pictures, and obviously pictures became digital. You know, you, you couldn't touch and feel them. You can email them to people, and you didn't have to really take a printout and put that in an envelope and so on, but you could really do things digitally. And then over time, we made more and more things digital, like the camera itself became digital, where you can't even touch the camera. Right in the year 2000, 2001, we had digital cameras in which what it produced was digitized, so you couldn't touch and feel that thing anymore. But in the next five, seven years, what Apple did and what Google did after, it digitized the device itself. You couldn't even touch the device. Right? Now the camera itself vanished. Somebody digitized it. Somebody virtualized it to a point where it became an app. It became an app on your phone. And I think that is what we really were very, very keen on, is that let's not try to build a new market. Let's take a new idea to an old market. And the big lesson was also from Apple. Again, this is about creativity that, you know, at the end of the day, to be creative, you need to bring an idea from another world to a new world, and that's where money is. That's how you actually create something very new. So what was happening around us in the personal life was this digitization of our personal experiences. The fact that a lot of devices were vanishing. The camera vanished. The GPS device vanished. The video camera vanished. The music player vanished. The feature phone, the flip phone vanished. The Rolodex vanished. The voice recorder vanished. They all were totally digitized. Right? So there was this convergence of our experience that was happening. You know, everything was becoming an app on top of an operating system. And that operating system people called an iOS, and over time it also became Android. But there was this extremely rapid convergence of our experience that was happening on top of an operating system. And a lot of these hardware devices that we all had to deal with in our lives were becoming pure apps. So this was the other light bulb moment uh, for us as well, that look, if it's happening in our personal lives, it's actually going to happen in, in the business life as well, in the world of B2B, not just in the B2C world of personal computing, but also in the world of enterprise computing. You know, one of the things that I always teach myself, and because I respect history a lot, and there's a saying that goes like, the more things change, the more they remain the same. The more things change, the more they remain the same. There's a certain constancy to our you know, lives and our, the way we actually think of things, uh, the way we relate to things. So the way we related to an iPhone experience, we said, look, let's bring that to the world of data centers and computing infrastructure. Let's make a lot of these devices that we actually see around us into pure software. And that was the rise of Nutanix. You know, that was how the company was created. We said, look, the, the difficult part in all of that was how do you take this architecture to the old applications the last 20 years. Because otherwise, if you waited for new apps, you'd probably never be in business. So that's probably the biggest thing that you all have to go and think about as you go and start your company is, do I have a new idea, a new architecture, but am I expecting a new market? Or can I go back to the old market right now and help them transition, help them transition from the old to the new, actually? And that's where design really becomes very, very important. So one of the things that I learned as an entrepreneur is the value of design. And I know that you folks actually have a course in design in this, uh, in this university. But over time, I think uh, I've learned a lot more about the respect for design. Like, design is, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. But 
In fact, the more we scale this business, the more I realize the value uh, of, of the word design itself. Because it's not just about product design, which we'll talk about. It's also about organizational design and business design. You know, the word design is actually ubiquitous. It's used in a lot of ways. But the real goal of design is to reduce friction. So if there's one takeaway from this room when you walk away from here, there's only one thing you need to remember about business or about an idea, reduce friction. If you can be really good at reducing friction, you'll be a great leader in whatever you do, whether you're building a product or building a business or you know, leading an organization, building an organization, scaling businesses, you know, scaling organizations, you know, building next generation, anything. The word friction is really important to understand. And how do you reduce friction is at the core of anything delightful. So in product design, in fact, it's, it itself is a trifecta. There's like multiple things you could do in product design. The one that we commonly think about and talk about is user experience and user interface. And what we're really talking about is a human machine interface. Like, you know, how do we really reduce the friction so that humans can consume machines easily. There's an ease of use where you don't have to learn it and get a certification and do like classes to understand new products. You know, something as simple as uh, your Android experience or iOS experience where even a two-year-old can, can go and really swipe things and they can look at pictures or video or whatever. That's how simple we made the experience of a smartphone, you know, I think. And that's the crux of uh, one of the pillars of product design is human machine interaction, reduce friction at the boundary of humans and machines. And uh, obviously it's visual and it has aspects of experience and how do you reduce the number of clicks and how do you make things automated and how do you have machines do more and how do you have machines not escalate as much to humans. There's a lot of stuff around machines doing more and not having to cross the boundary and you know, giving every kind of junk to humans because then humans get involved in a lot of things that they shouldn't want, shouldn't be even getting involved in. So think hard about human-machine interface and how do you reduce friction there. Now the second interface is machine-machine because machines have to reduce friction talking to other machines. And the word that we use is APIs. Anybody here uh, heard the word APIs? APIs? Half the crowd here. This is great. I think the, the sooner you get to respect the word APIs, the better you will be at designing products. And what do the APIs really mean? It's really about machines advertising what they do. They won't tell them how they do it, but they just talk about what they do. So these are my capabilities. I'm a service. You can call me for this. And I have some agreements, and I have uh, promises. I've made promises to you that I'm going to be available, you know, 99.999%, and I'm going to be reliable with my content and my data and my truth and my trust and... 99.9999999199. So people use all these nines to express trust and agreements. But at the end of the day, APIs express the promise of a service or a component or a machine. This is what I do. And if you need something from me, just invoke my APIs. So machine, machine, important. Very important to understand machine, machine. Because you will plug into someone, some other machine. You'll plug into some other software. Whatever you build, needs to be pluggable in an existing ecosystem. And that's why APIs become really important. So that's machine, machine. And the last one is human, human. And really important uh, to understand as you build organizations you know, and products, because they're products that actually will increase friction between people. Like the product that we built actually improved the uh, friction or reduced the friction between humans and machines and you know, figured out a way to reduce the friction in machines and machines. But because we were changing organizational structures, you know, what we were going out to the large organizations with was really changing the status, challenging the status quo of organizations. We were really going and demanding that organizational, uh, organizational behavior actually change and, and people converge and have one team rather than a team for data management, another team for compute and virtualization, another for networking and so on and so forth. We were saying you got to change the organizational structure where you have a combined team as opposed to three or four to five different teams. And that actually added friction to a lot of what we were doing. So we had to think really hard 
as we were re-architecting products, think about organizational changes and organizational friction as well. So think about these three things. You know, whenever you're thinking uh, about uh, design, think about you know, product design, think about organizational design, think about uh, business design. But even within products, think about you know, the man-machine interface, the machine-machine interface, and the man-man interface, or the human-human interface, actually, is just to be uh, correct. Uh, uh, you know, so uh, design is important, you know, and I think uh, all of you should really start to get the sense. The sooner I learned it, now I learned a lot about design and appreciating consumer-grade simplicity from Apple. Learned a lot from Apple. Now I'm learning a lot from Uber because my company is changing, and I'll talk about why Uber is important, the notion of suppliers, and what does it mean to really disrupt large companies is through supply to really create a network economy with suppliers and consumers, which is what Uber does or which is what Airbnb does. So the next 10 years of Nutanix is really about asking the question, what would Uber do? What would Airbnb do? Like the way we asked in the last 10 years about what would Apple do? And he brought this what would Apple do uh, sort of philosophy to a very boring world of the enterprise computing. In fact, the, you folks might have heard the word B2B, you know, which is different from B2C. And B2B has a very funny uh, sort of uh, meaning. In fact, one of, our, uh, my, one of my reports, his name is Inder Sidhu, he says, B2B means boring products to boring people. That's what B2B really means, as opposed to B2C, which is about you know, things that are sexy and you know, fast moving and on the mobile and touch of fingers. So we really had to bring a lot of consumer grade stuff, like consumer-like things in the world of B2B, and that's one of, been the, one of the biggest reasons for our success, is when a lot of the people who actually deal with infrastructure and enterprise computing and cloud and all the stuff, we go back and they say how simple Nutanix products really are. The word simple is very profound, and I think uh, you will realize as you go and build your careers is that it takes, uh, it takes energy. It takes a lot of energy and a lot of focus to make things simple. And... Uh, the word simple I've started to appreciate a lot more in the last 10 years itself. Now, I think uh, there's some other mentors that I've learned a lot from that uh, I hope you folks will go and read their books and learn as well. One of them um, that I've learned a lot from is a, is a really good friend of mine now. You know, I met him almost six years ago at uh, uh, one of my VC's uh, summit, you know, Coastal Ventures. Anybody here heard of Vinod Khosla? Here? Probably half the crowd here. So Vinod is one of our investors. He invested uh, probably $25 million, and we've returned almost a billion to him. So you know, that's how you know, we actually build friendship with our VCs. Um, so Vinod, I learned a lot from myself. But you know, he does this thing annually. He used to do it annually. It's called KV Summit, the CEO Summit. And that's where I met one of my uh, mentors and friends and advisors now. He's also my... Uh, one of my closest friends now. His name is Deepak Malhotra, and he's a professor of negotiation at uh, Harvard Business School. And I bumped into him, and I said, you know, obviously before that, negotiation to me was something simple. And I give you something, you give me something, and we meet in the middle. But there's a science behind negotiation, and uh, probably Dr. Jain could tell you a little bit more about negotiation too, uh, because I heard he's a good negotiator. Uh, but uh, there's a lot to learn, and if somebody had told me when I was uh, early 20s or even late teens to learn about negotiation, I probably would have done that, and I'd probably be a better entrepreneur right now. You know, uh, the book that he's written, one of his famous books, is uh, "Negotiating the Impossible," and you'll learn from case studies about what does it mean to even finesse the word negotiation, and negotiation not in a bad way, but in a positive way. You know, he insists and asserts and emphasizes that negotiation is about human interaction. And it's something that you all will find a lot of value in, in anything, you know, whether it's personal lives or the way you go and negotiate with your employers or in the future as you go and negotiate uh, when you build a business, the word negotiation becomes one of the very important tools uh, that you will actually go and use. Uh, he's written other books as well, but his most recent one is Negotiating the Impossible. Um, the other advisor that I've learned a lot from uh, his name is Mike Robbins, um, and he's written good books, uh, but he focuses on the word authenticity. 
And it's a very philosophical word. It's a very abstract word. Uh, but as we scale the business, Nutanix is you know, today about 4,500 people. We are in 60 countries. We ship to about 140 countries. So we have customers in 140 countries. We've done more than $4 billion in business. And this thing is scaling. It's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. But what cannot change as we scale the business is how authentic we are with our customers. And uh, that is probably the most important attribute of even a leader, you know, is the word authenticity. So Mike Robbins, he actually has made it into a formula for a lot of nerds out here who want to really believe in formulas. So he talks about a spectrum. He says, look, uh, people fall into a certain spectrum of authenticity. On the left of the spectrum is dishonest people, like slime balls, you don't want to deal with them. If you shake hands with them, you want to go and wash your hands right after. So those are dishonest people, and we all know what dishonesty probably means. He says in the middle of the spectrum are honest people. So that is highly contrarian. Like, what do you mean that honesty is not good enough to be in the right of the spectrum? It's in the middle of the spectrum. Honesty is good, but it's not good enough. So it it's basically scratches your he you know, head a little bit. Like, what does it mean to say to be better than being honest? And he says two very profound things. He says, look, you've got to take something out of honesty, and you've got to add something to honesty to make it authentic. So what you take away from honesty is self-righteousness. And self-righteousness is a, is a very, again, a word that I probably didn't understand uh, till I was in my 30s. Even today, I try to understand it, but I don't fully grok it. I don't fully know it. But self-righteousness is a very simple thing. It says, just because I'm right, you must be wrong. That's self-righteousness, right? Just because I'm right, you must be wrong. And uh, honest people can be self-righteous too. Like, well, I'm just honest. I'm just telling you that I'm right and you're wrong. So he says, you've got to take out self-righteousness from honesty. And what you've got to add to it is another highly controversial, controversial words. Uh, he says, what you've got to add to it is vulnerability. So honesty minus self-righteousness plus vulnerability is authentic. And again, the word vulnerability is a very kind of boring word, like, oh, are you asking me to be vulnerable when I'm taught to really go and show how strong I am and how powerful I am and how uh, you know, aware I am and how I know about everything. I know about a lot of things, so I do not need to show my weakness. You know, that's the opposite of vulnerability. But he talks about vulnerability in a very positive way. He says, this is what really makes great leaders. And, I think the way we even interact with our customers, you know, you know, you need to have that element of vulnerability to really show how authentic you are. So we go and talk about our weaknesses to our customers, and they appreciate it because you know, they see high integrity in that. Because now you're doing what you're saying, saying what you're doing, you're setting low expectations, you know, and you're going and over-delivering on your lower expectations. So I think you folks should really, really try to, I mean, if I, as I said, if I were your age and if somebody said vulnerability is important, I'd probably laugh at them. Because at this age, you're being asked not to be vulnerable. Um, and uh, vulnerability is something that I have at least been following a lot for a while now. And uh, in fact, even in the boardrooms, it's now being appreciated. If you look at Satya Nadella and Sundar Pichai and uh, many of the new CEOs actually in town, even Dara uh, Kuchra Shahi, the new CEO of Uber, they're all being appreciated for being vulnerable. You know, the way Dara goes and you know, deals with London when they ban Uber in London is very differently than the way they would have done it 20 years ago. You know? And I think it's affecting the boardroom as well because people are saying, I want to relate to authentic CEOs as opposed to those who basically just go and think that they're cleverer than the world, actually. And the world is really watching every leader out there to say, are you being authentic? Are you vulnerable? Do you come back and show a different side of you. Like Microsoft in the year 2000s, that whole decade, it lost out because it was arrogant. Microsoft, the, the 2011 and beyond, the last seven years, a very different company because they talk about how little they know. It's not that a lot has changed under the covers, but they have gone and related to the customers better than they used to relate to customers before that. Because before that, it was all about Microsoft. Windows and Xbox and you know, office and this and that, all about them as opposed to about the customer itself. And while they were doing all that, the world had moved on to the point where Microsoft lost on mobile, they lost on social, 
the lost in search, and the lost in a lot of things. While they were being arrogant and thinking that they are the son of the solar system, when it was about the customer. So I think, again, the word uh, vulnerability you know, is something that I spend a lot of time on to really think about what does it mean to have empathy for the end user and the customer rather than arrogance about yourself and how cool you really are. In fact, the other expert uh, that teaches vulnerability and talks about vulnerability and has written good books on vulnerability is somebody that I learned a lot from. Her name is Dr. Brene Brown. And uh, Dr. Brown, uh, she is probably one of the most popular TED Talks uh, on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and search for Brené Brown vulnerability, you'll see like a, a TED talk with probably about 40 million views. So she's that popular, and she talks about vulnerability as a first-class problem that we all have to go and deal with. And both Mike Robbins and, and uh, Brené Brown have written some really good books. Mike Robbins' book is called Be Yourself Because Everyone Else is Taken. Be Yourself Because Everyone Else is Taken is, is a book that you will learn a lot from, even at this young age, to understand how to have confidence and how to really talk about your weaknesses and how do you really embrace the word authenticity at this young age. And Brene has written a book, uh, it's called Daring Greatly. And it's probably one of my best reads in the last uh, 10 years. Daring Greatly really goes and talks about vulnerability. And uh, it's just story, a lot of stories about what it means to even interact with other people and how do you really embrace vulnerability and how do you make it powerful uh, how do you be different? You know, if, you, if this room uh, understands vulnerability better than the rest of the world, you probably are better at a lot of things in life, actually, because you know how do you use your weakness to become your strength, actually. You know? So look at uh, Be Yourself. Look at uh, Daring Greatly. Read the books. You'll probably get something new to really go and learn from. Um, I think... Uh, with that, I think, I mean, I can keep talking about books. The other book that's one of my favorites, uh, probably my most favorite book, is a book by one of Intel's founders. Um, his name is Andy Grove. And the book that he wrote is called Only the Paranoid Survive. Anybody here read the book, Only the Paranoid Survive? Manisha, is anybody else? It's, if there's one book in your life that you want to read, I can tell you it's that book. It's Only the Paranoid Survive. And uh, it talks about uh, the highs and lows of companies. It talks about Intel, a company that actually looks like it probably never had any weaknesses in the past. It'll talk about the fragility of Intel, the near death of Intel. Intel al almost died in 1984 because of the Japanese and their control of manufacturing and memory systems and so on. That It forced Intel out of the memory business in 1986. Uh, both Gordon Moore um, and uh, Andy Grove People here heard of Moore's Law? Anybody hear Moore's Law? Moore's Law? Gordon Moore? Gordon Moore and uh, Andy Grove were running Intel, and both would have been fired from Intel in 1984 because of how much they sucked at really competing with the Japanese. And uh, in one of the chapters, Andy talks about how they were sitting in the Santa Clara office, and they were looking at the as the Ferris wheel, which was in Great America Parkway, there was a big Ferris wheel, and they were both looking out the window, and they basically asked this question. So Andy asked Gordon, Gordon, what would a new CEO do once we are fired from Intel? And uh, Gordon says, they'll get out of the memory business. So he's like, why don't the two of us actually step out of this room and walk in as if we are the new team and we really get out of the memory business. Because it was hard to let go of something they had worked on for 20 years and accept defeat and go and do something new, which microprocessors was like 5% of the business and 95% of the business was memory and they had to get rid of that memory business. So it's a great read about history, about resilience, about you know, how life actually has its highs and lows. I know there's some amazing chapters for those of you who will go on to build companies. The ch two chapters back to back. And uh, now these become a little more relevant as you start companies and run companies. But even probably as you do your festivals and programs and things like that. So the two chapters are really interesting, uh, uh, interestingly named. The first chapter in chapter 7 is, says, let chaos reign. And uh, you're like, wow, you know, you're talking about letting chaos reign. And the reign is with a G, 
Let chaos reign. Let it be king. Right? The next chapter, the reign in chaos. With, without the G. R-E-I-N, reign in chaos. And it's the paradox. How do you really let chaos reign? When things are new, it's like an infant is born and you actually let the infant go and create chaos. Well, they learn how to crawl, there's a lot of chaos, and then they start to walk and they start to run, and over time you rein in the chaos of a child to go and say, now you need to have a structured life and you need to figure out how to go and attend school and be good at this and that and so on. So I think uh, if there's a book that you could read multiple times, it's that book, uh, Only the Paranoid Survive. Um, and um, yeah, I think with that, uh, I'd like to open it up for questions for folks to just ask anything and everything about, uh, um, you know, no question is uh, too blunt, no question is uh, too honest. Uh, and I'm, I have my uh, you know, peers, and Dr. Jen is sitting here as well, would help with uh, answering things as well. I think uh, the way I'd like to end this thing uh, is how values matter. And we were not taught a lot about values back in school. Of course, there was you know, uh, discourses in psychology. I took a lot of psychology courses, and I took linguistics courses, and I took a lot of math courses, even though I was doing computer science. Uh, but uh, our company, you know, we have made it very simple. We said, look, four values, you know. Simple to remember, hungry, humble, honest, with heart. And heart is about giving. So hungry, humble, honest, with heart. Four H's, simple to remember. Now, difficult to practice. So, so you know, of course, values are easy to remember, but how do you practice them? So we've come up with our own principles. You know, what does it mean to really run uh, you know, the company with these principles that help you achieve those values? So think about a value system in your life that over time will actually help you. Uh, one of the values that I actually really, really respect a lot is, uh, is uh, Anti-fragility, like what does it mean to learn from failures and get better with time, actually? And this is another one of my favorite authors. Uh, he's written some really good books. You know, his book, uh, one of his latest books is called Black Swan. Anybody here read uh, Black Swan? A few people here. Uh, it's a good read. The first, uh, I would say, 60 pages of Black Swan are really good read. And then it gets really profound and difficult to understand. But it's, again, uh, a spectrum. You know, it talks about a spectrum like the authenticity spectrum. So it says left of the spectrum is fragile systems, things that when you leave them and they break and you cannot restore them to the original state. Those are called fragile systems, like a porcelain cup. You drop it on the floor, it breaks. It wouldn't come back to its original state. On the middle of the spectrum, Nicholas Taylor, who is the author of the book uh, Black Swan, says the middle of the spectrum is resilient systems. And very much like honesty, it's not good enough to be resilient. So the fact that you're resilient is good, but not good enough. And this is about failures, and as you folks really, you'll go through a lot of failures. I've gone through a lot of failures. I could go deep into my failures and spend like another two hours talking about my failures and the rejections and the things where I was not accepted and uh, how our company had near-death experiences. And obviously, we were probably the fastest company to get to a billion dollars in revenue. But it all looks so hunky-dory from the outside. The company had a lot of glitches and a lot of near-death experiences uh, in its nine years of existence. But it's also true for your careers, actually, for your lives and the kind of things that you'll all go through. Uh, so what does it mean to actually learn from failures? But learning from failures is not just resilience. It's anti-fragility. So fragile systems resilient systems, which basically they restore to the original state, but then anti-fragile systems, they get better from failure. So they actually don't just restore to the original state, they actually get to a better state. And this is true in nature. Today, if you think about nature, the most powerful and enduring systems are anti-fragile, like your immune systems. Think about immune systems. You know, we learn about a new bacteria, and we get better. Like we got inoculated when we were young, and we learned about that bacteria and that virus, and we actually got better. We said, next time we know how to fight this. So immune systems are anti-fragile systems. Our bones are anti-fragile. The more pressure you apply on our bones, the stronger they actually get. So 
I think that's probably one of the other authors and mentors. I've met Nicholas uh, a couple of times. Uh, his books are not that easy to follow, so I would probably spend some time slowly reading them. But he has written a couple of really good books. Uh, one is Black Swan, the other one is Anti-Fragility. So Anti-Fragility, which is anti-fragile, the book is anti-fragile, and Black Swan are good books to actually go and learn from. And uh, one last thing before I actually open it up is, uh, if somebody had told me when I was not even 20 to learn languages, I think uh, I'd be a much better entrepreneur. So learn some languages. You know, if you can be a polyglot, if you can learn German and Mandarin and Japanese, three big GDPs that don't know English, you'll probably do well in your life. So beyond English and whatever your local uh, language, mother tongue is, three languages. It will take some time. I, I hear German is easy to learn. I, I'm lazy now. I probably, my brain cells are not uh, strong enough to learn a new language, but I'd love to learn uh, all these three languages. But if you could do it, start now, Mandarin, German, uh, and Japanese, you'd probably be a 10x better entrepreneur than I am. Okay, thank you so much, folks. We'll open it up for questions.